Hello, and welcome to this presentation, Understanding I2C. This presentation will provide you with a brief technical overview of the I2C serial protocol and how it's used to transfer digital information. The Inter-Integrated Circuit Protocol, commonly called either I2C or I2C, was developed in 1982 by Philips. It's one of the most common serial protocols and, as the name implies, it's used primarily for short-distance data communications. I2C is a synchronous master-slave type protocol in which both the master and the slaves can send or receive data. It operates bidirectionally in half-duplex mode and can run at different clock speeds. Only two wires, serial clock and serial data, are used in I2C. In the remainder of this presentation, We'll go step by step through the frame structure and operation of I2C. We'll begin with a basic I2C topology. A master is connected to one or more slave nodes via two shared lines, SDA or serial data and SCL or serial clock. These two lines are each connected to a voltage, VCC or VDD, by a single pull-up resistor. We'll explain the role of these resistors later in this presentation. Note the devices can be added to or removed from the bus at any location and at any time. I2C nodes exchange data over this shared bus in the form of frames. Let's take a high-level look at I2C frames. An I2C master claims the bus by means of a so-called start condition. It then sends the address of the slave that it wishes to communicate with as well as an indication as to whether it wishes to read data from or write data to the slave. The slave acknowledges its presence and its readiness, after which the data is transmitted and acknowledged. The communication is terminated by means of a stop condition. Let's now go back through this frame and explain each of these fields in more detail. In I2C, the idle state of both lines, SDA and SCL, is high. The start condition occurs when a node first pulls SDA low and then pulls SCL low. Pulling these lines down in this order is used to claim the bus, and the node that claims the bus is now the master. This procedure prevents other nodes from taking control of the bus and thereby reduces the risk of contention, that is, two nodes trying to claim or use the bus at the same time. Once a node has seized the bus, that node also begins sending the clock signal that's used by both the master and the slave. Immediately following the start condition is the slave address, which is used to specify which node the master wants to communicate with. Each node on an I2C bus must have a unique fixed address. These are normally 7 bits long, with the most significant bit first. I2C also supports 10-bit addresses, but these are uncommon. Addresses may be hard-coded for each device, but in many cases, the address is partially configurable using external address lines or jumpers. For example, addresses for this board can be partially configured using three jumpers. In order to configure this address, both A2 and A0 would be jumpered, and A1 would be left open. At this point, it would be a good idea to pause for a moment to talk about the timing relationship between the data and clock lines in I2C. In this diagram, we can see that SDA does not change between the rising and the falling edges of the clock signal. Data is always read during the middle of the clock pulse. Expressed another way, we can say that during data transmission, SDA only transitions when the clock is low. This is necessary because an SDA transition when the clock is high would indicate the start or stop conditions. Immediately following the slave address is the read-write bit. This bit is set by the master to indicate if it wants to perform a read or a write operation. If set to zero, this means that the master wants to write data to the slave. And if set to one, it indicates the master wants to read data from the slave. Recall that the standard slave address in I2C is seven bits long. And in many cases, the read-write bit is decoded or interpreted as part of the address byte. The acknowledge or act bit is sent by the receiver each time a byte of data is received. Zero is an acknowledgement and one is a negative acknowledgement or a NAC. 
recall that the I2C bus is idle high. So if the receiver doesn't actively respond by pulling the line low, this will be interpreted as a NAC. Every slave address or data byte is followed by an ACK bit. An ACK bit following a data byte is sent by the receiver to confirm correct reception of the data. An ACK following a slave address is sent by the address slave to indicate that it's both present on the bus and that it's ready to read or write data, depending on the state of the preceding read-write bit. The address ACK bit is followed by the data byte, which is the actual information being transferred between the master and the slave. Although this is often the contents of a memory address or register in the slave device, this may be an address location itself. We'll talk about this more on the next slide. Data is always sent as 8-bit bytes in I2C, with the most significant bit first. Every transmitted byte is followed by an ACK bit, which, as mentioned on the previous slide, is set to zero by the receiver when the data has been properly received. In many cases, multiple data bytes are sent within a single I2C frame. Additional bytes are simply concatenated onto the previous byte, although note that each data byte must be individually acknowledged. I2C doesn't specify the contents or the purpose of data bytes. These bytes may be all data, but often one of them will indicate an internal address or register location in the slave device. For example, if the master wants to write a certain value to a specific register within the slave, the first data byte might be the address or location of that register, and the second byte would be the actual data that's to be written to that location. Since the number of data bytes can vary, there must be a way to indicate that the final data byte has been sent, and this is done using the stop condition. First, the SCL line is allowed to return high and remains high, and then SDA returns high and remains high. Recall that for data bytes, SDA only transitions when the clock is low. If SDA transitions when the clock is high, this unambiguously indicates the stop condition. After the stop condition, the bus becomes idle, there's no clock signal, and any node on the bus can use the start condition to claim the bus and begin a new communication. Let's now come back to the role of the pull-up resistors in I2C. As we know, SDA and SCL are both normally high, and this is because each of these lines is connected to a voltage via a so-called pull-up resistor. Note that there's only one resistor per line, not per device. Each I2C device contains logic that can open and close a drain. When the drain is closed, the line, SDA or SCL, is pulled low because it's now connected to ground. When logic causes the drain to be open, the line goes high because it's connected to voltage. Remember that in I2C, the idle state of the lines is high, and therefore you may sometimes hear I2C referred to as an open drain system. Pulling an I2C line down to ground is usually much faster than pulling that line back up to idle voltage. The time required to pull a line back up is a function of both the capacitance of the bus as well as the values of the pull-up resistors. The value used for the pull-up resistors represents a compromise. Higher resistance increases the time needed to pull up the line, and this in turn limits the maximum bus speed. Lower pull-up resistance values decrease pull-up time and allow faster communications, but they also require higher power. Typical I2C pull-up resistor values are in the range of about 1 kilo ohm to about 10 kilo ohms. The values of the pull-up resistors are one of the factors that limit the maximum bus speed. I2C can operate at various bus speeds, often referred to as modes, and this table shows the maximum speeds that are achievable for each mode. Hardware is categorized as supporting one or more of these modes, meaning that the device can, theoretically, achieve the corresponding speed. But in many cases, bus speed is limited by other factors, such as the ones mentioned in the previous slide. The last two modes achieve higher speeds by modifying standard I2C behavior. High speed mode devices are backwards compatible to the lower speed modes, but can temporarily switch the bus to a high speed mode by transmitting a special sequence. Ultra fast mode is unidirectional, that is, it's write only, and also makes modifications to the standard I2C protocol and frames. Let's end with a brief summary. 
I squared C is widely used for exchanging data over short distances using two wires, serial data and serial clock. In I squared C, a master seizes control of a shared bus and then reads or writes data in the form of a frame containing the target slave address and one or more bytes of data. Each of these data bytes is individually acknowledged and a special start and stop sequence is used to mark the beginning and end of a frame. Pull-up resistors and an open drain are used to create the high I2C idle state. Devices can be categorized by their maximum supported speed, but the practical data rate on an I2C bus is also a function of the pull-up resistors and overall bus capacitance. This concludes our presentation, Understanding I2C. If you'd like to learn more about serial protocols or solutions for analyzing and decoding serial protocols, please see the links in the video description. Thanks for watching.